Written on the pages of the great book of nature lies a truth so profound that it has beckoned men and women throughout the ages to seek its wisdom. We will continue this quest and study many stories of humanity as we search for this light. On this journey, we will examine philosophy, religion, and science to uncover the hidden mysteries behind myth and legend using the symbols of universal Freemasonry. Welcome to Legends of the Craft. Welcome back to Legends of the Craft. I'm here with Brother Axel Savari, and we're going to be doing a show today on Cagliostro. Count Cagliostro, was he a magician or was he a charlatan? And personally, I lean towards magician, but I think, Brother Matthias, we should start by explaining who was this character, Alessandro di Cagliostro, this charlatan or magician of history that has had such a profound and, I think, personally, an unknown impact on Freemasonry. Very little is known about his upbringing. There's things that he claimed. There are uh, people he knew that claimed otherwise. Historians have really dug at the subject, and there's no clear conclusion. One idea is that he was the Prince of Trebizond, which is a empire that is in what is Turkey today, north uh, along the uh, Black Sea. That's what he supposedly claimed as someone. And uh, his father was overthrown, and he had to flee, and he ended up in Medina in the Middle East. Um, so he kind of grew up sort of in an Islamic kind of yeah, system. By, by his memoirs, he was uh, taken in, I believe, by um, the, the sultan of some place. They called him the Sharif, uh, and he lived in this palace. And that's where he was given his occult tutor, uh, Althotos. Is it Althotos? Yeah, I think that's correct. So there he, he, he basically formed this relationship with his tutor, and his tutor took him around to all of these holy places in the Middle East, uh, throughout Syria, Lebanon. They brought him to the pyramids of Egypt mm-hmm. um, and basically took him into all of these places that nobody really saw, and he was introduced to this kind of initiatory tradition, or at least this is, this is what he claims in, in his memoirs. And it was from there, after he had to leave that adoptive home, that he ends up on the island of Malta and joins the Order of the Knights of Malta. Now, before we go on that idea, the second theory is that he was an orphan uh, on the island of Malta and that the Grand Master of the Knights of Malta, his name was Pinto, uh, raised him as his son. And therefore, he gained all the information of the occult, of magic, of hermeticism from the Grand Master. So he was kind of raised in this initiatory sort of system. Well, Malta is an interesting place in terms of uh, like this Renaissance and post-Renaissance history of Europe. Malta is an is is a stop on the way between um, the old world of Europe and the Middle East, and all of the kind of like mysteries of of that land that the that supposedly the Templars brought back, and that Malta was like a way station for all of these things to be exchanged in going in both directions. And so the Knights of Malta they had a head they were headquartered on the island. They had this massive library and this supposed you know secret treasure house of all of this wisdom and and occult items that they had collected over the centuries of knights and pilgrims going back and forth to the Holy Land and to Europe. So the idea is that he was kind of somehow, whether or not he arrived there later or he was actually uh, brought up by the Grand Master, that he was raised in this tradition of, of um, occult knowledge, which was very rare at the time. Like, you know, we have access to it because of the internet. But the idea, like, just having the, the Kabbalah in book form was like an incredible treasure in, in, in the uh, 18th century. Another interesting little side note on Malta is that supposedly maybe Napoleon was initiated there too during uh, his campaigns, which would be only a few decades after this point. Now, a third theory is that he's neither a prince nor was he raised on the island of Malta by the Grand Master, but he was the infamous Giuseppe Balsamo, a forger and con artist, and that he had created this identity of Cagliostro. Uh, by which to present himself to the royalty as he traveled through Europe in his later years. 
but he was just sort of a, a poor boy that grew up and learned how to take advantage of people and was selling snake oil, essentially, to people to make money. Which, to be fair to the proponents of that theory, was a thing that was done at that time. There were charlatans who purported themselves as alchemists to try to extort money and fame and recognition out of the royal houses um, that would hire their services. There's two things I think that, that we can argue in defense of Cagliostro. One is is that no one that knew Balsamo ever saw Cagliostro, according to historical records. It was only the other way around. And I think the second point is, is that as he's traveling throughout Europe, he's meeting princes and kings and all sorts of noblemen, including uh, cardinals of the Catholic Church, and they all write very positive about him. They talk about how he's healing the sick for free, and that his goal is never to make money. So why would all these you know, important people in Europe be writing all these very positive things saying that you know, making money was not at the heart of his work? Yet, you know, on the outskirt, it seems like when you look at history, like you, go, you look at Wikipedia right now, it's just automatically assumed that Cagliostro was balsamo. I reject that completely. Well, and we'll get into this later in the podcast, but I think the reason for that is probably that towards the later part of his life, and, and really when he was um, you know, going around purporting Egyptian Freemasonry as being a restoration of Freemasonry, he got involved in um, the political climate of Europe in the 18th century, which was very hostile. There were a lot of, a lot of intrigue and assassination and grand mm-hmm. political events were going on at the time, and he found himself at the center of a few of those. And that, does, that tends to um, make yourself some enemies, and which means your reputation is going to be impacted in the future. People are going to write some things about you that may not be true in order to serve whatever narrative they were em- employed in. Well, the gentleman that basically called out Cagliostro for being Balsamo is himself a confirmed charlatan, a person that engaged in pornography at this time. And a French spy. And a French spy, yeah. So, I mean, he's a scumbag. <laughs> and it's scumbag calling another guy a scumbag. So we, I think we have to be very careful at these accusations. But because, you know, the upbringing of Cagliostro seems so fantastic, people have to automatically start to break that down and accuse him of not being who he is, that he must be a liar, he must be a uh, snake oil salesman and all that. And when we really look at his work, he's far too educated and he's far too precise in the way he speaks and his goals, I think, to be a con artist. So let's get into that kind of that background and history. Where Does he come into Freemasonry first or is he uh, come to Freemasonry through occultism and hermeticism and occultism? Nobody really knows. I mean, it kind of goes back to, you know, was he raised on Malta? Therefore, he kind of was introduced to the to the degrees of the Knights of Malta at a very early age. Uh, some people believe he was initiated in Italy. Other people believe he was initiated uh, in Germany or the Hugue. Um, but of what we do know is that on April the 12th, 1776, in London, he was initiated into a lodge of the right of strict observance. And this is a very interesting offshoot of Freemasonry. It's Masonic. Uh, it doesn't really exist too much today. There are uh, remnants of it in the world. But the the right of strict observance is Masonic in that it has the same sort of rituals, but it's declaring a tie to the Knights Templar. And we have this idea being introduced of the unknown superiors, of the head of all true Freemasons. Uh, Some call it the secret brotherhood. Mm -hmm. But there's this idea that the occult world is being run by this secret brotherhood of adepts with the intent of converting Europe from monarchy to republic, from tyranny to liberty, to end slavery, and to bring justice and fraternity and equality to all. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the the right of strict observance is also has is deals heavily in this concept of a restoration of Freemasonry, right? The the idea that Freemasonry as it was then was in a state of g- degeneracy, that it had mm-hmm. lost a lot of its character and of its essence, and that's a huge theme for Cagliostro in his later life. Is with Egyptian Freemasonry, he's there to restore the the true occult nature of Freemasonry, the true esoteric message of the craft. Well, he's proclaiming a tie to the ancient mystery schools and that this wisdom is ageless 
and that it's being lost because Freemasonry at this time is just degenerating into a social club of good men trying to maintain their networks, their links for money, for um, for advancement in society in a very secular way and not in a spiritual way. So in the so in a sense, he goes further even than the strict the the right of strict observance in in claiming a lineage from the Templars. He's saying no, this goes back even further to Egypt and perhaps beyond. Absolutely, and the Egyptian Freemasonry that he creates. Um, there are copies of the ritual that have survived to this day. Actually, the story is really interesting. Uh, there was a Scotsman who was in France during the revolution, the French Revolution, and he was able to take a copy back to Scotland. And it was in this family's sort of uh, library until the widow at some point took this ritual and donated it to the Grand Lodge of Scotland. So it's on record there. Now, it's pretty full of content, but at the same time, there's a lot of things that it refers to that is that have not been written down. So we don't have the full scope of this Egyptian Freemasonry. It kind of has the same system as the craft. You know, you have an apprentice, you have companion or fellow craft, and you have master. And what was very interesting about this ritual is that it's it it limited the number of members. So there could only be seventy two apprentices. 24 uh, companions or, or fellow craft and only seven masters. So every lodge was limited because one of the accusations against Cagliostro is that he set up Egyptian Freemasonry as a way of making money, of defrauding people. But if you wanted to get as much money as possible, why in the hell would you limit the number of members that could join a lodge? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'd want to open it up to everybody that would join in the hopes of getting as many members as you could possibly attract. If, if money really is your only goal. But putting those kinds of limitations, like, to me, indicates that there is something more serious at work, that there is, that there is an actual mission here. And I think that's the, you know, the point you're making about um, this right of strict observance that's trying to shift society in a different direction. It's not, you know, just to contemplate Masonic ritual and to, to be a better person or whatever that means, but it's, it's to actually um, take humanity and shape it and move it from where it is into a better state, right? A, it's a grander scope of work. And so if you're just trying to make money, that's not really what you want to do. Mm -hmm. You don't want to endanger yourself by like, you know, um, trying to overthrow governments. That's not what you do if you're trying to make money. If you're trying to make money, you just gather as many people together and tell them what they want to hear and then make them pay for the privilege. But it doesn't seem like that's what Cagliostro is doing here. No, I don't think so. And, and, and a second part to this is that in order to join Egyptian Freemasonry, you had to already have passed the craft of regular Freemasonry. Mm. So some people think he was here to destroy the craft. No, he believed it was a good place as a basis of education, but there was further to be learned in Egyptian Freemasonry. So if he wanted to make money, why would he require membership in a regular craft lodge. That would limit the number of people that he could bring into this. Well, not only that, but it would expose him to ideas that were out of his control. Like if you look at cult leaders, they don't let you join other cults, right? If you're going to be a member of a cult, you're going to be a member of that cult and no other cult and everything else is wrong. So if he's saying, well, you first have to go through craft Freemasonry in a lodge that I don't control before you can come in and do what I'm doing, then Again, to me, this indicates that this isn't just some kind of money-making scheme. This is an actual program of education and, and of change. Well, anybody that picks up a copy of this ritual, which you can – I don't know if it's online, but there are several books that outline this specific ritual. It's very in-depth. It's very esoteric. Um, it's far more detailed than the regular craft. I, I find it absolutely amazing. So it wasn't written uh, to – pull money out of people's pockets there's there's no uh there's nothing in that insinuates anything other than we need to leave the material world and ascend to a spiritual one well and and on that point too i mean not only to show that it has some of its own integrity but another point against it being a money-making enterprise the egyptian right was co-masonic it initiated both mm -hmm. men and women and at the time not only is this socially revolutionary but it's, you know, it goes directly against regular masonry. So if you're trying to just attract ma attract rich male masons to like, you know, to just give you money, well, you're not going to offend them by saying, you know, everything that you learned about gender and masonry is wrong. Like 
admitting women was illegal for Masons to do. Like exactly. by the by the laws of those lodges. So if you're one of He's make pissing mo- them off. Exactly. And that's not a great way to attract customers, right? Now, the way they were co-Masonic was a little different than our co-Masonic organization. So there was lodges for men and there was lodges for women, but they could visit each other. So he was kind of like the Grand Master and the um, Serafina, who was his wife, uh, was the Grand Mistress. So they used the right of adoption for the female section of the ritual. Slowly, they were going to amalgamate the the male lodges and the and the female lodges into mixed lodges. And Serafina, his wife, was a big part of the development of the Egyptian rite. Like she was his um, traveling partner throughout Europe. And as, as they tried to, you know, gather all of these occult and esoteric secrets, she was there with him. And so they kind of, they built this whole thing together. It wasn't just the, the creation of Cagliostro that he let his wife participate in. She was a big part of, of forming the thing in the first place. This is very important in co-masonry, in my opinion. The idea that when you have a married couple, the power that they can develop in a ritual exceeds that of an individual. When you have a counterpart that's on the same journey as you, sharing in the same values and wishing to explore the occult as a team, you've, you've increased your power tenfold, in my opinion. Yeah, it's kind of, there's an exponential kind of effect to that partnership. And especially like, you know, balancing the masculine and the feminine energy, balancing those two perspectives when it comes to examining Masonic ritual and symbolism and, you know, occultism by, by merging those two forces and the unique perspective that neither one can fully understand the other. And that by combining the two of them, you have a, a greater insight into these mysteries. So in the rituals... Um, Calistro does something very interesting. He, he brings a lot of magic into the ritual. So in the first degree, in the degree of apprentice of the of Egyptian Freemasonry, um, you're put in a chamber of reflection and there's this massive pyramid on sort of a painting on the back wall. And below it um, is a man going into a cavern like underneath the pyramid, but he's scared. This old man's scared. And then there's a, there's an hourglass. There's a, there's a symbol of time there. And this plays a huge part in the ritual, which is how man is scared of his mortality. But he must overcome it if he is to gain immortality. So you begin in the chamber of reflection confronting this fear of time. And as you're led into the ceremony, you know, there's obligations and all that just like regular craft lodges. But it all points towards... This idea that you must work to gain your immortality. This, this is much closer to the church than it is to the social clubs of the various Grand Lodges today. Well, and perhaps you'll disagree with me on this, but I think that's what's meant by magic in Masonic ritual. It's, it's taking these philosophical and theological concepts and making them a real place for you to inhabit, a real thing for you to go through, an ordeal that actually happens to mm-hmm. you, right? So that these experiences are, are properly imparted. Like you actually live them. They're in your skin. They're in your bones. And I think that's what we mean by magic, like doing things that represent these symbolic concepts instead of just hearing about them later, right? Like seeing mm-hmm. the pyramid, see, feeling that fear in the chamber of reflection, that uncertainty of things to come, as opposed to just being told man fears his mortality. Like actually being in the position where you end up fearing your mortality is a more magical experience. I really like what you said, Brother Axel, and it, what it brings to mind is the alchemical process of of Cagliostro's ritual. He he he. he heavily emphasizes the number seven. Uh, He talks about seven colors. He talks about the seven uh, laws of hermeticism. And he talks about the seven processes in alchemy by which to transform or transmute lead into gold. And in this process, he's basically saying that the ritual, if you do it properly, will allow you through seven steps to move through the planets, through the seven classical planets, towards your immortality that the planets are like um they're objects of destiny that are forcing us or anchoring us down into mortality but by this process of alchemy we can overcome these anchors these forces that are predestining us towards death and and when we can overcome them 
that's how we become immortal. You know, and there's a connection there, maybe not all the way back to Egypt, but um, at least back to the mysteries of Mithras. The seven grades of Mithraism, at least according to Franz Cumont, were through the seven classical planets. Mm -hmm. Each grade was personified by one of these planets, and they represented a stage in the evolution of the human soul. And, and it was set up the same way, that these planets represented a ladder by which the soul had to move outward from materiality back to spirituality. So maybe not all the way back to Egypt, but there's another connection there bringing us you know, thousands of years backward to a similar tradition. I think all these traditions of the mysteries have the same intent, which is to help us overcome our mortality and gain immortality. It's in the craft. Mm -hmm. It's it's just not so pointed as how this is to be achieved. It's it's hidden in the symbolism. Egyptian Freemasonry is more pointed at, you know, this is how you're going to do it. And there's a real interesting part in the catechism of the first degree which says, what are the what are the meaning of the two columns? The same columns we find in the craft lodge, Boaz and Jacob. And the answer is, these two columns, called Jacob and Boaz, are not two columns at all, but are in fact two men who sought to learn about natural and supernatural philosophy. And it's interesting, this idea that there are two paths, natural philosophy and supernatural philosophy. Well, is it um, Lamech in the Bible that builds the two pillars to to um, sustain the the two forms of human wisdom? I think it, one's made the of deluge. one's made of brass, one's made of marble to survive different. Things. There are a lot of different stories, and so in some it's one material or another. But there's mm -hmm. always this idea, and, and some and sometimes it's not him. It's it's di it could be Methuselah, different mm -hmm. people. But there's always a story of two columns being used to ensure that humanity's information is is preserved through catastrophe well it reminds me of the two uh two extremes of the the kabbalistic tree of life and the idea that there's a path that goes from each extreme to the other in order to fully kind of fully educate you about the realm that we find ourselves in as human beings and that, that it is an upward movement but that it goes from side to side because we have to we have mm -hmm. to impart something from each side so even back then, we're seeing this idea that science and faith are not opposite and hostile to one another, but complement each other. Mm -hmm. The two columns of natural philosophy and supernatural philosophy. So he's basically saying here that there is a scientific path and that there is a magical path and that they complement each other and they parallel one and parallel one another. So in the Egyptian rite, the, to pass from the first to the second degree takes three years of study. I love work. it. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a very serious, a real strict observance of the ideas of Freemasonry. You know, if we look back to um, the School of Pythagoras, you had to wait five years to move to the next degree and then seven years to move to the third degree. In the Egyptian rite, it's a period of three years of study where, where that lodge completely ensures that whoever the candidate is, is really thoroughly taking on the lessons of that degree. Now, the catechism in the second degree is missing. So we don't really know what's said to the candidate as they pass from the first degree through the second and into the third. But there's a definite shift in the tone of the ritual from a, a material focus, a, a focus of escaping kind of the mundane world and its traps and, and the uh, curiosity of things and into a more idealistic, spiritually focused uh, third degree where you you start to contemplate this immortality that you've been approaching. But in order to get there, you have to take that full journey through mortality into immortality. And the second degree kind of sits in the middle, but we don't really know what it says. It's been lost to history. Once you're in the second degree, though, it's at five years to the third degree. So we're starting to see the appearance of the of the mysterious numbers of three, five, and seven. But it would be a total of eight years before you could go to the master's degree, and I think that's a, a totally appropriate amount of time to really digest the symbolism of, of Masonic degrees. And, you know, any any time less than that, you're not really getting a full grasp of what's going on, and and you're not allowed to engage in the actual transformations within. Uh, in a given month, you know, when, when we look at our male craft brothers and they're receiving the Scottish Rite degrees of the 4th to the 32nd degree in a weekend, what type, what type of transformation is taking place? I don't think anything is. Now, I think afterward, as they study the degrees, those that actually do so can find that transformation. But receiving the degrees, 
it's not helping them at all. Mm -hmm. No, I definitely think this, it, it kind of goes back to that point I was making when we were talking about the, uh, the chamber of reflection and, and magic and masonry is that, you know, magic needs time to work. A lot it of do, time. It doesn't just, it doesn't just, you know, come about like life itself is magical enough, but it needs time to unfold itself upon you. It's not just going to, you know, completely transform your consciousness in one night. You know, you can be led in that direction, but those effects have to take root. You have to act on them. You have to really shape your life in a different way than it was before you started this whole process. That in order for the magic to really work, it takes a long, long time. Mm -hmm. So in the third degree, and I, this is amazing to me, uh, the candidate after eight years is brought in. Um, actually, let me back up. Right before he's brought in, um, as the lodge is being open, the... The, the venerable master uh, of the lodge uh, has a sword and uses the sword, goes up to each member and creates a magic circle in front of, the, of, of each member of the lodge, preparing them for this um, raising to the third degree. Now here, we're not going to find any sort of like myth of Hiram or any traumatic story. What they do is the candidates again put in a chamber of reflection. They're asked several questions. Um, of their readiness to be moved from the second to the third degree, and then they're brought in. And on the floor, it begins with a skirret, which um, basically has a, a string of six feet, uh, about the size of the candidate, and they use chalk to create a circle on the floor. Then the candidate lays down in the circle like the Vitruvian man. And at the four points of the circle around the candidate is incense, myrrh, laurel, and myrtle burning um, as the master says all sorts of incantations to prepare this uh, candidate to receive the master's degree. So what do, what do you think maybe that meant right there? Man, and that's, again, like that's such a departure from what we have as masonry today. Like, first of all, the absence of the, of the myth of Hiram. Is, is a huge departure. So, you know, all of a sudden you're in a completely different magical realm. Like the the burning of the incense and the herbs around you implies a a much more like much more ancient derivation of that practice. Like myrrh and myrtle, like those are really old mm -hmm. items in magical ritual, like going back to the time of Christ and, and long before. I mean, they're probably something that he found in some book that was some uh, remnant of an Egyptian practice or something like that, that are meant to evoke these um, kind of elemental responses and very spiritual response. And, and in, in the sense of like summoning spirits, not like spiritual, like religious, but in spiritual in the sense of like calling down spiritual entities to inhabit as, as offerings basically. Yeah. yeah. Well, but like in the, in the traditions of like, you know, um, the Goetia and like summoning demons, so to speak, like you use different herbs and different offerings to attract different essences and different spirits. So he's definitely calling down something to inhabit the room when this whole ritual is taking place and the whole, you know, the Vitruvian man, the circle, the, the, the candidate lying in candlelight on the floor, it implies a, a completely different dimension of the third degree than, than I think anyone's completely ever experienced. Different. Something I would like to do, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So here, let's check out some of the lines that is, that are read by the venerable master and they're, they're from Psalms. Um, it would begin with, My God, have mercy on this man according to the greatness of thy mercy, and remove his inequity according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Cleanse, cleanse him thoroughly of his sins, and purify, purify him of his transgression. For he acknowledges his inequity, and his crime is ever before him. He has sinned before thee alone, he has done evil in thy sight, so that thou shalt be justified in thy word, and victorious in thy judgment. Thou seest that he has been begotten in inequity, and that his mother has conceived him in sin. You know what this sounds like to me? This sounds like a an acting out of the idea of the Egyptian Hall of the Dead, where you come before the gods and your heart is weighed against a feather. That to me sounds like it, it's like a, a Christianized, Europeanized version of that that would make sense to that mind. But it's essentially this concept of, well, you show up in the Hall of the Dead and you have your gods in front of you and they're preparing to pass judgment upon your soul. Right. As you mm. as you leave one world That's for the next. Like, this yeah. is this is basically the Christianized version of that ritual. You're being prepared for immortality. Yes. 
The last line that I really like that the Venerable Master says here, Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, offerings, and burnt sacrifices shall they offer on thy altar. We beseech thee, great God, to grant him the grace which thou hast granted to the grand coft, first minister of the great temple. And the great temple there is, is the great pyramid, right? That's what that's what he's beckoning back to? I think so. Yeah. Which that, is in the first degree. Mm-hmm. Well, it is Egyptian Freemasonry, after all. That is, you know, what all the symbolism of this rite is, is pointing backwards to. Yeah, there's two interesting points here. First, you know, when, you read, when you're reading through this ritual, there's not a lot of references to actual, like, Egyptian sites or ideas. Now, granted, the Rosetta Stone hasn't been found, so uh, hieroglyphics hasn't been, like, uh, it really it hasn't been understood Egypt really by anybody. It really is still a mystery at this point in history. Like, nobody's actually been there. The Sphinx is still under the sand. Mm-hmm. Nobody can read this stuff that's, that's on the pyramids. No, so the idea is that this ritual is philosophically... Uh, conveying the ideas of old Egypt. Yeah, so there is, you know, that makes the whole, um, that that hall of judgment idea even the more interesting because the European Academy has no concept of this. We haven't translated any of it. They don't know of the gods mm-hmm. yet. So so how does, how does Cagliostro able to create that scene in, in a, like if he's a charlatan, right? It's not that he just read a book on Egypt and could, and could like, you know, Christianize their rites and rituals because the European mind has no concept of what the Egyptians believed or no. the idea of the Hall of the Dead. But but yet that's such an obvious parallel to that scene. So where did he get that information? Or is he just, you know, tapping into something like in the Akashic Record or whatever that he kind of like ends up thinking that way because you naturally do when you when you contemplate that idea? Or did he really possess some kind of knowledge received from a, a secret source? Well, I think it's very obvious that if he was raised in the Middle East and he had traveled to all these ancient sites, which have been a very unique experience for anybody at that time from Europe, that he gained knowledge that the average European wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. And if he was, in fact, raised by the Knights of Malta, outside of the fact that, you know, he's reading and researching and meeting people across Europe, he's putting this together as a restoration. And this, and when you read the ritual, it's it's so different and so amazing that I I have to believe that it is a restoration of of the true ideas of Freemasonry. Well, and when you get into the right of strict observance and the idea of the unknown superiors, then this is again another um, I suppose feather in the cap of that idea that like well okay so he didn't so that information wasn't available he didn't make it up he got it from his teachers but that points to a continuation from the days of Egypt, of these ideas, right? If somebody imparted it to him, which I think, you know, obviously there's no hard evidence for me to point to, but I think in the passage that we read there, the the parallels there are unquestionable. Like that, that's the same scene that's being described. So if he got that information, who gave it to him? And what tradition is that a remnant of? And that we may never know. I think if if Cagliostro is guilty of anything, it's... um, Of self-flattery? Yeah, I think so, because when you read the ritual, uh, as you know, like they're always calling upon, upon the Grand uh, uh, Koft. The Grand Koft is him. You know, That's the, the equivalent of the Grand Master. And they're always saying how great he is and how amazing he is. So you know, I do think he was a bit in love with himself, and you know, he inserted himself into the rituals uh, more than he probably should have. So that's, that's a bit of a critique on my side of things. Um, but that's also not a sin that doesn't mean you're a charlatan because uh, you're maybe you're a little infatuated with yourself and and maybe there was a purpose to this maybe he was trying to to create uh um a solidified structure around his persona well that's what i was going to say in in defense of, of doing that you know to me i think we 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 have to refrain from analyzing these things with our modern minds and with the information that we have, like the way that you and I and most people approach, like trying to find out if something's real or true is like, well, are many people able to experience this? Is it, does it have a tradition of documentation? Is there evidence for it? But for the same reason that I think, um, you know, Blavatsky used mediumship and, and, and you know, um, seances to spread the ideas of theosophy, 
these people had to work with the minds of the people as they were, not as they wished them to be. So the average you know, mind that's interested in this in the 18th century probably needs a, a figure to coalesce all of this around. They need a, a, um, a personality to, to wrap all this up in, right? And we it's, still need that today. Sure, I absolutely. Mean, you know, I, I think in today's society, we kind of think that's a bad thing. And maybe to the extreme, it, it obviously is in terms of, you know, cults and, and other type movements. But you need leaders. Like, you know, no movement can really exist without strong leaders, people that are examples of the ideas that are trying to be championed. So I don't think we have to crap all over the idea that, that personalities are important. Well, you know, people are vehicles for their ideas. Like if, if we look throughout history at, at bad ideas and good ideas, we always identify them with a person. Mm-hmm. We don't look at the, the Reformation in general. We look at Martin Luther, right? We don't look at Nazism in general. We look at Hitler, right? We look at the personality that espoused them. So I, I don't think it's at all a bad thing to, to use Cagliostro, to use his teachings, his lifestyle, and, and his character as a human being to analyze the philosophy that he was imparting and, and the um, contribution that he made to masonry. I mean, people, you know, people's ideas are separate from themselves in a sense, but in a way that they're not. Like they are still the production of that person. And so they're informed by their experiences and their character. So I, I don't think you can ever take the person away from their idea. I agree 100% with you, Brother Axel. And there's something you said earlier that, that I want to bring up as we finish up talking about the, the third degree here of Egyptian Freemasonry, um, which is something that was definitely inspired by Cagliostro's career, which is seances. So after this, this circle is drawn on the floor by chalk, using a skirret, and the, and the candidates put in there like the Vitruvian man, and all these words are said, and there's a consecration, um, there's like a tent in the room that's kind of like the tabernacle out in the desert, the Jewish tabernacle. And the candidates led it into one of the chambers, um, which there's just a candle in it. And then remember, all the members are outside around this this tent. But in the in the final chamber of the tabernacle, which would have been the, the equivalent of the Holy of Holies, is a young boy, which they call the dove. And a dove in seances is is the medium. So when you go to, to, to seances back at this time, they'd bring in like a, a virgin, a girl or, or a, a young, pure boy. And that would be the medium by which for us to communicate with the other worlds. So this, this young boy's in there, and then some words were communicated through this dove, um, this, this innocence, which transmuted the knowledge of immortality into the candidate. So the candidates, again, in, this, in the second chamber of the tabernacle, a young boy is in the third chamber of the tabernacle, and there's a, there is a communication that takes place, a, a transference of information of immortality. Between the candidate and the dove? Yes. Like the dove speaks to the candidate from some you know, otherworldly force or something? Exactly. Yeah, that's magical. <laughs> <laughs> so that, like, that's how you create magic and ritual. Like, you have to leave room for a moment of the unexpected. Like, if everything's scripted, like, it can be very powerful, it can be very dramatic, but it's those moments where the candidate, like, if the candidate is alone or if the candidate has to speak for himself or, you know, go into a tent and, and receive some some unplanned some communicate. Sacred knowledge. Something that's unexpected, right? That's, that's what makes something magical is that moment of, I don't know what's going to happen next, but whatever does is going to be very impactful. Now that we've taken a look at the ritual of Cagliostro's Egyptian Freemasonry, why don't we take a look at the inspirations for this ritual? And I think there's three important areas. The Count of St. Germain, the Old Testament, and Rosicrucianism. No story of a mysterious alchemist would be complete without a visit from the Count of St. Germain. This guy crops up in every story of every interesting figure of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. And so to me, it's no surprise that he's also cited as an influence on Cagliostro. So in 1815, there was an anonymous work called The Lies of the Alchemistical Philosophers. And in this book, there's sort of biographies of different alchemists, but one of the most interesting accounts is Cagliostro meeting the Count of St. Germain in what is known as the Temple of Mystery. Is there a, a, a specific place in Europe he goes to to find this temple, or is that kind of glossed over? That's not in the writings. It, there's a description of the temple. There's an altar 
with a vase that, that underneath is the inscription, the elixir of life. There's a mirror in the room. And, you know, the Count of St. Germain, I think, is like floating above some sort of furniture or something. It reminds me of that great scene in uh, the book, um, Brother of the Third Degree, when they go underground into the, uh, the, the cavern mm. of trials almost, and they have to go through all these stages of, you know, alchemical tests and tribulations in order to prove themselves. And in the You past- know, well, hold on. You know, now that you say it, I'd never thought about it, but perhaps... The Brother of the Third Degree drew its inspiration from the lives of the alchemistical philosophers because you're absolutely right. Like they, they parallel themselves, the, the writing, um, almost exactly, honestly. So we have a passage here that is uh, allegedly a speech that was given by the Count of St. Germain to Cagliostro after he had uh, passed his series, of, him and his wife had passed his series of trials. That's another interesting point is that they went through this together. They, they had to go through trials separately, but him and uh, Serafina approached this temple as a, as a pair. Just to add a little fact to that, when you look at Mozart's magic flute, the story in, in, the, in the opera is very similar to Cagliostro's Egyptian Freemasonry and to this encounter with the Countess Saint Germain, this idea that there's a woman and a man, as there is in the magic flute, and they, they have to go through a series of trials of the elements and after that they're you know initiated into the order the other very interesting thing about the magic flu is that the high priest is is Zarastro which is very close to the name Cagliastro so there's this idea that Mozart was very much inspired by Egyptian Freemasonry and perhaps was even a member there's no evidence of that but some historians believe that may be the case because his opera is is completely shaped after Egyptian Freemasonry. You know, the other name it's reminiscent of is Zoroaster. It's almost like a uh, like a mashup of Cagliostro and Zoroaster, the uh, the figurehead of um, Zoroastrianism, like the this ancient Persian deity. You know that there are these um, Middle Eastern influence of, 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 upon European esotericism is very interesting to me. That like it's because of this importing of these almost otherworldly beliefs that this whole um, movement begins to flourish. I mean, I have no doubt that a lot of the inspiration for Egyptian Freemasonry comes from sources much older than uh, Christianity and you know the normal Judeo-Christian roots. But the symbolism is all in that because that's what everybody is at the time. So, Brother Axel, why don't you read um, this passage that we've selected from the lives of the alchemistical philosophers? So this is St. Germain speaking to Cagliostro after he's completed his trials. Elected from my tenderest youth to the things of greatness, I employed myself in ascertaining the nature of veritable glory. Politics appeared to me nothing but the science of deception, tactics the art of assassination, philosophy the ambitious imbecility of complete irrationality, physics fine fancies about nature, and the continual mistakes of persons suddenly transplanted into a country which is utterly unknown to them. Theology, the science of the misery which results from human pride. History, the melancholy spectacle of perpetual perfidy and blundering. Thence I concluded that the statesman was a skillful liar, the hero an illustrious idiot, the philosopher an eccentric creature, the physician a pitiable and blind man, the theologian a fanatical pedagogue, and the historian a wordmonger. Then did I hear of the divinity of this temple. I cast my cares upon him with my incertitudes and aspirations. When he took possession of my soul, he caused me to perceive all objects in a new light. I began to read futurity. This universe so limited, so narrow, so desert was now enlarged. I abode not only with those who are, but with those who were. He united me to the loveliest women of antiquity. I found it eminently delectable to know all without studying anything to dispose of the treasures of the earth without the solicitations of monarchs, to rule the elements rather than men. Heaven made me liberal. I have sufficient to satisfy my taste. All that surrounds me is rich, loving, and predestined. It's a very interesting passage to me because it makes, you know, this character of St. Germain, who, you know, nowadays has kind of been elevated to almost a god, seem like a man. Like, a man that's gone on an extraordinary journey, to be sure, but but one who started where everybody else started. 
Now he says that he was, you know, groomed from his youngest days for this. So it implies that, you know, to reach this position, you kind of have to be introduced from it, introduced to it um, at the, at early stages in your life. Otherwise, you're not going to make it to the heights that Saint Germain is talking about here. I totally agree, Brother Axel. And there's um, a line earlier in the text that you didn't read, which I think we should add in because I think it's important because it says that. Rather outrage reason and courageously maintain every unbelievable absurdity. And I think that almost encapsulates everything that you read. Like you, you, you must believe in everything theoretically before you can discount anything. Like you can't just come in as a skeptic. You, you, you have to see that there are absurdities, there are paradoxes in life. And that when there is one, there's something there to be learned. There's, there's a, there's a puzzle to be solved. Well, it's like St. Germain says is he's moving through each of these stages, right? Talking about politics and, and military tactics and history and philosophy and all these things. It's like you have to take each one seriously one by one until you realize that they're foolish. But like, but you can't come, come in that way. Like you said, you can't start being like, oh, the whole world is an absurd you know, stage play. It's like that's correct but only after you've reached the end of your journey this kind of leads me to think about alistair crowley's idea of believing in things that you don't believe in that you know if you're researching let's say jesus it's not enough just to read all the historical facts on jesus you you need to pray to jesus you need to encapsulate all that is jesus so you have to put your your mind in sort of this mode of belief and later on, when you move on to study something else, you can you can you can discard that. But in the moment, if you really want to understand something, you have to believe it with all your heart. That doesn't mean you have to believe it for the rest of your life. But in the moment of study, it's essential that you have belief because if not, if you're coming from that point of view of being a skeptic, then in the end, you're never going to penetrate the inner mysteries of your researches because you're you're preventing yourself from really like, you know, diving into the study. Well, I think that mode of belief that you're talking about is the qualification that allows you to pass that threshold, you know, from from your studies across that threshold into the esoteric where, um, you know, teachers like St. Germain live. They live in a realm of belief. And it and it I, you're right. It's not about like when, when you get to that stage, it's not about being right or wrong or, or having the correct facts. It's like how like can you believe something to be true so strongly that it is? Like that's the real occult power. It's and, and, and you know, you have to study and, and, and take these individual compartments seriously in order to do that. But really, like the power that's being cultivated is this power of belief. That's what allows you to do all these incredible things. Well, to believe in immortality, to believe that you can live forever. And this is what the Count of Saint Germain is giving to Cagliostro, this formula of immortality, this elixir of life. You have to have a lot of belief here because this is something that the ordinary man will be like, this is false. This is not true. Only God grants immortality. How can you give me something or, or how can I perform a ritual that would give me immortality? But this is where this this concept of immortality is introduced to Cagliostro and it becomes a very big part of the Egyptian rite of Freemasonry. Well, and with modern science, we know that the human body can believe itself better. We can heal on the pure Placebo. power of belief, right? But but if we were able to consciously control that and not have to be tricked into it. And and I think again, like that's kind of always been something that's hinted at in the mysteries is that the mystery schools exist to teach the initiate to consciously use what the rest of humanity has to be tricked into doing. Like that's the reason for the exoteric. It's to kind of like guide and shape our reaction to certain stimulus to achieve certain ends. But the esoteric is to, is to teach the student how to do that for themselves and not have to be governed or led or preached to or, you know, given these ideas, the ability to generate them for yourself by the same technique. So let's move on to the second subject, which is the Old Testament. You know, uh, when we get to the part of the Inquisition, you know, they're going to, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church is going to say that Cagliostro is anti-Christian, but very, he was very much a Christian and he very much believed in the scriptures and it played a very big part, especially the story of Genesis. So Brother Axel, why don't you read what Eliphas Levy had to say about 
Cagliostro and his fascination with the Old Testament and a very interesting symbol that we can discuss afterward. As explained by the Kabbalistic letters of the names Asherat and Althatos, it expresses the chief characteristics of the great arcanum and the great work. It is a serpent pierced by an arrow, thus representing the letter Aleph, an image of the union between active and passive, spirit and life, will and light. The arrow is that of the antique Apollo, while the serpent is the python of fable, the green dragon of hermetic philosophy. The letter Aleph represents equilibrated unity. This pentacle is reproduced under various forms in the talismans of old magic. The arrow signifies the active principle, will, magical action, the coagulation of the dissolvent, the fixation of the volatile by projection, and the penetration of the earth by fire. The union of the two, the serpent and arrow, is the universal balance, the great arcanum, the great work, the equilibrium of Jacob and Boaz. The initials LPD, which accompany this figure, signify liberty, power, duty, also light, proportion, density, and law, principle, right. The Freemasons have changed the order of these initials, and in the form of LDP, they render them as liberté de penser, liberty of thought, inscribing these on symbolical bridges. But for those who are not initiated, they substitute liberté de passe, liberty of passage. In the records of the prosecution of Cagliostro, it is said that the examination elicited another meaning as follows, Lilia destrue pedibus, trample the lilies underfoot. And in support of this version may be cited a Masonic medal of the 16th or 17th century, depicting a branch of lily severed by a sword having these words on the excerpt, Talem dabit ultium mesem, revenge shall give this harvest. What an interesting reading, right? There's a lot of symbolism to unpack in that passage, yeah. The, I mean, the first thing is the symbol of a serpent in the form of an S, holding an apple in its mouth, and being pierced by an arrow to form what we would know as the dollar sign. And I can't help to think, is, like, is, this, is this where the dollar sign comes from? I don't know enough to say one way or the other for sure, but I have definitely heard before of an occult origin of the dollar sign, that it is a a sigil that is used to generate a certain kind of magical energy. And if you, I mean, if you look at the effect that that symbol has had upon the world, it's kind of, it's not arguable to say that that wasn't the intent, or at least not the effect, because it has functioned as a sigil for centuries now. And it has captivated the mind of humanity when it comes to commerce, which is a huge portion of human life. So the amount of human energy and attention that has been diverted into contemplating the symbol, even unconsciously or unknowingly, is immense. Well, if we think about it, you know, the symbol of the serpent, what's the serpent? You know, it's Lucifer, that's the bringer of light. It has an apple in its mouth, which is temptation. It's it's good and evil. It's also a fruit. It's a reward. And what you have is this arrow piercing this serpent in three places, at the, at the neck, in the middle of the body, and the tail. And to me, that's basically saying that, you know, this enlightenment, this, this light that's being brought, um, can only be made manifest, only has the reward of the apple when it has touched the heart, the body, and the soul. So how would exactly would you make the correlation between the neck, the midsection, and the tail between those three elements? Well, I would say the tail is, is, is what would be like with the root chakra, it would be the body. Uh, the middle would be the heart at the center connecting the tail and the throat. And the throat would be the soul because that's how it, that's that's the that's the organ of speech. It's it's where we consume, and so um, it's where the spoken word comes from. And so that would be the soul or the ego, you know. And it is also an an occult concept that some of the most potent symbols should be hidden in plain sight in in, in ways that they will um, be in front of as many people as possible, but without you know. Um, creating suspicion as to exactly what they are like well the, be the best place to hide something is in plain sight right well and and not only that but to like put it on things of to put ideas of virtue on items of vice so like there's this idea that um the the tarot cards which are this like 
supposed to be this condensation of the mystical knowledge of Egypt, right? They're put on cards so that people that gamble and do, you know, engage in these vices around these cards are actually perpetuating ideas and principles of virtue. That, that there's also symbolism in what they are attached to. So by attaching this esoteric symbol to the dollar, I mean, the dollar has been used to do a lot of shady stuff, but even then it's still propagating this sigil. And no matter what the instrument itself is used for, the energy and the intent behind the sigil is still present in every transaction. I mean, I find that very symbolic, right? That in every human transaction, or at least most, because most people use the dollar, most human transactions are conducted with this sigil. So like no matter what, it's always harvesting human energy and increasing the power of its own metaphor. Well, and if we look at the 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 LDP, the the initials that also came with this the sigil, um, which is essentially referring to some elements in the Scottish Rite, um, this bridge of passage, a free passage, which can kind of be broken down into uh, freedom of thought, uh, freedom of expression, um, the various freedoms that we have in our society, or that we should have, should I say, and. The symbol then gives an allusion to freedom that, that, you know, when understood, it grants the holder with this ability to free themselves from all that imprisons them. Well, and what you said made me think of the idea, too, that like there is implied in in the symbol, the idea that you have to um, earn what it is that's being communicated. Right. Because of its attachment to currency. And this idea of free passage and buying free passage and earning it, like to approach the wisdom that's contained in it, like you have to do work, you have to trade something for it. Like it, it's, it's kind of giving us all the clues that we need to solve the mysteries. Like there's this alchemical symbol of the snake transfixed in three places by this arrow of light. But in order to understand that, we have to trade something for it or buy our understanding, not in the, not in the sense of like literally buying it with money, but like but earning it through work and and trade with the universe, not necessarily like human beings. And also the apple in the mouth, I would say, says that we have to have a strong will because Eve takes of this apple, not Adam, and changes the course of humanity symbolically. So, you know, she was tempted, but it's it's temptation that allows us to test our abilities. Without temptation, we would be automatons, we'd be robots. But this ability to be tempted and to resist temptation is really what defines human consciousness. No, you're right, because the snake is holding the apple in its mouth, but it's not biting down. Like and and, and that's the symbol, right? Is like how how close can you get to the objects of temptation without succumbing to that temptation? So, Brother Axel, what do the Rosicrucians have to say about Cagliostro? So, the Rosicrucian order writes that Cagliostro was an emissary of the Great White Brotherhood, dedicated to a mission of transforming the heart of society from what it was at the time. So, here's a different level of declaring him an adept or a master, that he's been sent to help humanity. And I would suppose that his ritual was his major contribution to that work in what set i think i know where you're going but can you explain more like how exactly can the development of an esoteric ritual of freemasonry have such a large effect on humanity i would say that his ritual influences masonry up until this day you know what we consider esoteric freemasonry those rituals that focus on the development of the self to be an adept or master in society to help humanity along the way originates from this time period. I don't think he's the only one. I think the Count of Saint Germain uh, influenced that movement as well. But his ritual infused this new energy, this new excitement, his very presence. He was so charismatic, his ability to sway a crowd, his ability to be humble and to help the poor and the meek, you know, altered a generation in my opinion. And and you know, some say that even he was the one responsible for the French Revolution. I mean, there's no evidence to that, but there, you know, he was arrested uh, by the French royal court because of this uh, diamond necklace affair, and he was found innocent. And then the people were so upset that someone like him, who was always helping the poor and healing them, was imprisoned in the Bastille. You know, so 
in some ways, he did help ignite a revolution that would change human history. Well, it, it also gets into the idea that what's done in a lodge or in a ritual of an esoteric body has consequences for the outside world that are that are for the most part unseen. But the idea behind, um, you know, in my personal opinion about what Masonic ritual is doing on a magical level is that it's creating a a center of connection between this realm and whatever ideal form that we want to bring into being. So every every time a lodge meeting is held or a ritual is worked, it's it's opening another connection to this to this future world, to this better world, to this kind of greater vision for humanity. And the more connections like that that can be established kind of in between this world and the next one, the easier it is for this other idea to flow into our timeline into our area of reality and so it's not just about you know self-improvement and all those kinds of things like the idea of Cagliostro and his ritual and I think of of true Freemasonry is to is to be opening these portals to allow the transition of this world to be more seamless into this more idealized and better form and I think to do that one is an adept. I mean, I think that word's taken out of context these days. I always see these people floating around and uh, they don't die. They don't age. Um, they have all these magical abilities. They're almost like demigods, right? And uh, not that I don't think they have special abilities to some degree, but they're people like, just like you and I, right? I wouldn't say just like you and I. Otherwise, well, perhaps... I mean people, but I'm yeah. saying they have bodies. You know, they eat, they drink. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I guess Count of Saint Germain <laughs> did it, but Cagliostro did eat. Um, you know, they have human relations. They speak mm -hmm. to people. You know, they don't just come down in some like cloud from the skies to to instruct us. They're 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 in the streets with us. They're, well, like the idea of th that you could help humanity without being a part of humanity is, I think, I think a little you know, it's it's misguided. You're missing the point. Like, in order to be a guide and helper of humanity, well, then you have to be a part of humanity. These aren't alien beings from some other planet, like you said, that are coming down to just wave a magic wand. They're, they're people that are going far ahead of the rest of us and coming back to show us the way. Like, I don't think any of this stuff is like really, you know, magical in the skeptical sense of the word. Like, I, I believe in magic. I'm just saying like where they are is just a place that's further ahead in human evolution. And they are the people that have chosen to come back to this level of human evolution to help bring the rest of us along. And I think that's why ultimately, moving on to kind of conclude this this podcast, um, he died at the hands of the Inquisition. And a lot of people say that's the evidence that he was a charlatan. On the contrary, I think that's the evidence that he was an adept or master. Mm -hmm. Because if he was just, again, some charlatan, going around trying to get money from people, why would the Roman Inquisition seize him, torture him for a year, and then place him in a prison of such strict guard? Because they didn't want anybody talking to him, not even the prison guards. They were petrified of Cagliostro. They burned his manuscripts in town squares. They collected everything they could about him, and they tried to erase the history of his existence. The mighty Catholic Church... The mighty Catholic Church is scared of this little guy going around trying to make money by forging documents. I don't buy that. that that's not a narrative that makes any sense to me. Because the night before his arrest, he, he'd gone back to Rome with his wife, and it was his bloody wife that betrayed him. She was tired of going from city to city. She was tired of helping the poor. She was tired of doing all this work. She wanted to, to marry a rich Roman I don't know, noble or something of the sort, and live uh, an extravagant life. So she betrays Cagliostro to the Inquisition. He's seized, he's taken, he's tortured. And that's where this idea that he's uh, Giuseppe Balsamo is really propagated because they wrote this book basically, you know, portraying what, you know, they had been finding out in their investigation. But he was betrayed by his loved one. He didn't even believe it. He didn't even believe that she had done it. And the funny thing is that she ends up going to a monastery and dying a few years later. You know, she, they, they tortured her too. And they basically sealed her off from the rest of the world. So she didn't get what she wanted. And in my opinion, she deserved it, frankly. Um, but at the end of the day, I'd like to get your take on this, Brother Axel. Why would 
this church, which is the most powerful organization on the planet at the time, be scared of a guy that supposedly just forges documents. Well, to me, to me, this is the this is the evidence that his whole like charlatan alter ego that really, as we've been going through this book, the Masonic Magician has been revealed to be its own sham. Like like if you read if you take a cursory reading of uh Cagliostro and his life you'll find that in the the mainstream historical sources it's pretty much accepted that he's a charlatan and all this stuff but really like when you really dig into the actual material of the contemporary sources and into his biographies you start to realize that there's a lot of contradictions with that idea mm-hmm. and that it's not quite so clear cut that he was just this Italian forger, Giuseppe Balsamo, who managed to pass himself off as this real, you know, ma- mystical wizard. And there, there are, I mean, honestly, like just looking at the ritual that he left behind, he, the, the man is not a charlatan. He clearly demonstrates a deep, deep grasp of esoteric and occult concepts this is not a man that picked up some some ideas from a scrap of a mm-hmm. book he once read in order to to sell some fake documents and some uh you know imposter egyptian art that's not, like the man is too deep for that the writings are too deep for that it it betrays a uh, a depth of ideology behind it that you can't just attribute to some simple con man i agree i mean he's he's obviously a man of extraordinary abilities of great intellect i mean his charisma was renowned throughout europe i mean noble men and women wanted his guidance you know they were you know he was friends with one of the high cardinals in france i mean this is to say that he's just some sort of you know sham artist is just absolutely ridiculous well and Well, well, well sorry to interrupt you but how many other people did the church kill that now they've apologized for, right? Mm-hmm. They haven't apologized for Cagliostro, but I'm waiting because I think he deserves an apology from the Catholic Church. I absolutely agree. I mean, the the idea that institutions like that would not do something like this in order to preserve their power, because you get, you get to realize like, the the type of existential threat that the philosophy of Cagliostro pose to organized theocratic organizations like that, like the idea that you know the supreme duty in life is to eschew material possessions and and heal the poor, like that is a truly Christian doctrine, but uh, it came into conflict with this institution that had been built around this idea that had now become so enlarged so engorged on the money and the power mm-hmm. that it accumulated mm-hmm. over centuries that really the the true vision of the church is, had been lost and here's Cagliostro living the life of Christ in my opinion it, it's it's funny I, there's a there's an old joke that like if Jesus encountered the church today they'd crucify him again for being a heretic, right? And, and it's that idea that kind of permeates Cagliostro's tragic end to me. In his Inquisition, he never betrays anything. You know, at the end, he finally, like, he signs a letter um, saying that he was wrong, but... I mean, did he, though? Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, they probably forged his signature, or they beat him nearly to death, so he wasn't even in his right mind. After he was condemned and he was taken to a prison in San Leo, which is, I, I think it's close to Rome, it's a little south of Rome, um, the, the, in, the inquisitor that was placed to, in, in, in charge of, of his imprisonment was completely petrified of him, uh, ordering guards not to talk to him, you know, because Cagliostro was like in his cell, like he would draw blood from himself to, to, to paint sigils on the wall. He had created little tools that he was hiding. He was constantly, he was just a pain in the ass, frankly, uh, to this in- inquisitor. And everyone started getting scared. The people in the town were scared. The guards were scared because he kept making these prophecies of what would happen uh, after he disappeared. In fact, at the end of the day, some people believe he didn't even die. Some people believe that he, that wasn't even him in the prison. But one it, one prophecy is very interesting. He said that within a couple of years, I think, after he died, the prison would be destroyed. And in fact, there was some uh, war that took place there, and um, a series of cannon shots destroyed the Tower of San Leo. Now, is that coincidence, or 
did he prophesize that? I don't know, but it's it's he he went through his whole life making these prophecies that seem to have came true all the time. Well, I think his whole life work, honestly, was a prophecy of sorts. I mean, to me, like every element. I, I see you laughing. No, but I'm but I'm serious. But I'm serious. I, I think no, no. I mean, I like that. I like that. He he suffered the same fate that every human being that's ahead of their time suffers. And, and and what is central to his work is this restoration of masonry. And you know, it's it's interesting to me that the same ideas that are being um, discussed in masonry now, like the idea that there is something lost about Freemasonry, that there's something that needs to be restored. He was so prescient that he could see this 300 years ago, right? And and suffered the consequences for it. He brought something to the world that the world was not ready for. Mm -hmm. But I think like, you know, I'm trying to think what, what can we learn from Cagliostro other than just an interesting story? It's this idea of restoration, in my opinion, that has to be carried on. His work was unfinished. Like the Egyptian ritual, like it changed a lot, but it didn't achieve everything that he wanted to do with it. And there's still a lot of work in masonry to be done to complete the restoration. We were going to go into the quarantines, but I think it's been an hour and 10 minutes. And I think we really, we could do a whole episode on his quarantines and the elixir of life. So I think we should do that as a future episode. But I think to, to sort of summarize um, the life of Cagliostro, and I, I really agree with what you said, is, you know, it's it's a life of regeneration and rejuvenation. He's trying to build something new to invigorate humanity, to, to remove vice and superstition and evil, to purify society of all that is wrong with it. And that is a noble goal. That is a goal that each of us today as Masons, whether it's co-Masons or Malecraft Masons or Masons of the Memphis Miserum Order, it doesn't make a difference. That should be our goal. And if it isn't, then we're missing the mark. What the hell are we doing? Pancake, you know, breakfast, spaghetti you know. dinners. Yeah, like, dude, yeah. That's that's not nonsense. We're here to bring about the restoration of the ancient mysteries. And anything short of that is a waste of our time. Thank you for listening to Legends of the Craft. This podcast is purely the opinion of brothers Matthias Comcier and Axel Suvari and does not represent the official views of Universal Comasonry. Universal Comasonry is a Masonic order founded on the principles of liberty, equality, and fraternity that admits men and women without distinction of race, religion, or creed. For more information, please visit Universal Freemasonry. That'll work.